All right, all right. Thank you for joining this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another great show for you, another debate. I have Robert Rowe and CJ Cox. It is a biblical flood global. That's what we're going to be debating today, and I thank you for joining us tonight. As always, I do want to encourage you to like and follow The Gospel Truth. Make sure you hit that like. Make sure you hit that subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you can stay in the loop with the gospel truth that's going on. Also, all this content is not only on YouTube, but also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So make sure you do not forget to follow and subscribe over there so you can stay in the loop with what the gospel truth has going on. Also, for your audio preference, I have all this content also on podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. So make sure you are flowing over there and following, subscribing there so you can take advantage of that 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 choice right there of audio only also i have a bunch of shows coming up here in the future that i do want you to be aware of coming up july 5th at 8 p.m eastern standard time does the mind show evidence for the existence of god that's coming up once again july 5th i have danny versus stillman smith i want you guys to check that one out so don't forget that this is going down after that can belief in god be properly basic i have david palman air fitzwater july 9th at 5 p.m eastern uh 5 p.m pacific standard time 8 p.m eastern standard time so make sure you're checking that one out as well after that i have an interview i have one with scott allen he is the author of why social justice is not biblical justice that's coming up this is coming up july 12th so make sure you check this one out because i'll be interview. i think this is going to be a great interview and after that you notice that this debate won't take place until september that's because i will be taking a paternity leave sabbatical leave i have a child that's on the way and he will be here in the next couple weeks so i'll be taking the rest of july off and august as well no live shows coming from me but this one's coming up september 3rd at 8 p.m eastern standard time so make sure you check that one out and nonetheless that is the next four shows coming up on the gospel truth so make sure you are staying in the loop with the gospel truth that's going on don't miss out on any shows uh that are coming up here in the future uh, that said i have robert Rowe and i have cj cox with me they're good friends so this is not going to be one of those debates that you expect two arch enemies getting together and create and and making a ruckus of a debate platform you won't get that from these guys these guys are our friends they've talked before this is not the first conversation they had according to this with this kind of this topic so i look forward to them having a great conversation if you remember robert though he last time he was on um he debated william harris and they debated biological evolution well is biological evolution inherently racist so that was a great debate. And Robert's been on it several times. So this is not a new uh, new chance to come on a platform for Robert. He's been on quite a number of times. And this is CJ Cox's first go around with the gospel truth. He actually had um, was looking to plan several debates in the future, but uh, for whatever reason they did not plan they did not pan out. So but I'm glad that he was able to he's able to jump on this time around. So let me bring these guys in so they can say hi to you. How y'all doing, fellas? What's going on with y'all? How y'all feeling? Doing well, thank you. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Uh, Robert, you are way over in well, the Australia, man. What you, what you doing over there, man? I think you muted, Robert. You muted yourself. Oh, man. wait. I'm on, I need to unmute. How are you there guys you doing? There you go. Yeah, I was just going to say the flood has taken over the entire universe. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the universal stuff, flood. Man. Yes, the universal flood. There That's it is, right. man. There it is. So we're gonna be talking about a little bit of that today. So was the was the biblical flood global? So this is gonna be a fun discussion. You know, the the local flood. Global fuzz is always a fun conversation to have, man. It's interesting. You learn new things every time you jump on these topics. So we're going to jump into this. And uh, before we do jump into it, actually, I do want to give you guys a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. So tell them what you do. Tell them your blog, website, YouTube page, whatever you do. Let the audience know so they can go follow you and check you out. All right. Start with Robert, man. Why don't you go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man? No worries. Thanks, Marlon. Always a pleasure. Um, you do an excellent job on this channel, uh, you know, organizing not only interviews, but also discussions and so on. You honor Christ through that, and yeah, I well, thank you for that. Um, for myself, I run Sentinel Apologetics, uh, and also I do this with a friend of mine. His name is Hunter Bailey. And yeah, it's just sort of like a passion. We don't really get much out of it except to pull together resources and grow God's kingdom through that and honor the gospel through that. So, um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to this discussion 
I want to. I, w- I would like to call this discussion a gracious dialogue because CJ and myself have really like hit it off uh, since ironing out all the essentials. So, in in other words, we actually agree on practically a, let's just say like ninety nine percent of what it is to be a Christian. The one percent is that that uh, the non crucial stuff, which in this case would be things like the flood and so on. So, um, yeah. That's basically me in a nutshell. All right. Thank you, Robert, once again for coming out on the Gospel Truth. All right, CJ, you up next, man. Go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you and also uh, Rob and the audience, of course, um, which I'll probably say again once I go into my opening, just so everybody's aware. <clears throat> Full of appreciation. Um, so, uh, my name is CJ Cox. Uh, I run the YouTube channel, The Synagogue. Um, that's, uh, the C Y N I C O G U E all one word. Uh, and it's a Christian apologetics program that focuses primarily on not any sort of like specific polemic, right? I like to talk about, uh, whatever it is that I'm, you know, thinking of talking about that particular time, whether it be Islam, Mormonism, atheism, certain things about fundamentalism, so on and so forth. Uh, but the main shtick of my channel, if you will, is defending fundamentalism uh, owning that label, because I think it accurately describes um, not only myself, but a lot of people who like to cringe at it, um, and also doing so from an intellectual framework, because I, I think there are a lot of people who are rightfully fundamentalist, but who think that means they need to throw away all references to philosophy and science and history and things of that nature. Um, although for this particular conversation, I'll get more into that, and we obviously want to get into this debate, but I don't plan on using too much uh, outside sources, and we'll, you'll get to sort of the reasons why in a moment. But nonetheless, that's my shtick. That's my thing. I also do a news channel called The Synagogue News. That one's not one word. It's The Synagogue, one word, and the news. And that's a you know more political talk show kind of thing that's been on kind of hiatus for a month and a half. But that's sort of my whole thing. Um, and, yeah, I appreciate, again, you guys uh, having me on here today. And I think this will be a really good conversation for sure. This will be, I think, like the third or fourth conversation I've had with – Rob, first one that's actually like a formal debate, though. So that'll be nice for sure. Um, it'll be a good conversation. All right, all right, guys. Good stuff, man. So let's jump into this. Let's not leave the audience waiting any longer. Let's jump into this. All right, so we go. Once again, the topic of this debate is was the biblical flood global? CJ Cox, you are arguing the affirmative. Robert Rowe, you're arguing the negative. The format is 10 minute opening statements. We're going to jump into five minute rebuttals after that. That's going to follow about 40 minute cross examination where both of you get 20 minutes to ask questions. And we've got five minute closings to do some QA from the audience. Sounds good? Absolutely. All right. Yep. All right. CJ, you are up. Next, you are up first for your opening statement. You're arguing affirmative debate. So let me know when you're ready. And I will start your 10 minute timer. All righty. Thank you very much there. And I am ready now. All right. You um, got it. So I just want to say, of course, shalom all and uh, blessings to everyone in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I um, want to, of course, again, thank Marlon for hosting me and thank Rob for having this discussion, um, as well as a big thank you to the audience for watching the debate and considering either position presented. That's obviously the most important thing here if we're you know, all here for a true pursuit of truth and God's word. Um, the question before us today, which I am answering in the affirmative, um, I wrote it here is, does the Holy Bible teach a literal global flood, but um, does the Holy Bible teach a global flood, or is the biblical flood global? Uh, either thesis works to present the idea, right? Is the Bible communicating to us a global catastrophe or a catastrophe that is localized to a specific region? Um, and it's a question which at one time was nearly universally answered in the affirmative by men of incredibly diverse cultural backgrounds, theological convictions, uh, native languages and tongues, and even positions in time, often uh, separated by thousands of years in the case of people like, say, from Tertullian all the way to Martin Luther, right? And we'll uh, hopefully look at some of the quotes from those guys today. Uh, it is fairly easy to see why, in my view, this has been such a ubiquitous position. For one, the book of Genesis is very clearly a historical narrative meant to communicate the history of man and the Hebrew people to man and the Hebrew people. Um, and, of course, it's such an important historical narrative that it ends up setting up all the other historical narratives that the Bible ends up building off of. Uh, the, ste- excuse me, the text starts for us with a literal historical chain of events 
uh, beginning with the creation of the universe down through the creation of man um, to the patriarch or the flood, the patriarchs, all the way through eventually to Joseph in Goshen, down to the kings, even down to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it gives us the Exodus, the judges, the kings, and like I said, all the way down to our Lord, providing genealogical details, historical documentation of battles, tribal formations, population movements, so on and so forth. Not only setting up these things, but even specifically containing them, such as the Battle of the Kings or the population movement of Hebrews into Goshen. Um, and of course, it also reveals to us the most important and theological point, God's outstretched hand to his unworthy creation through his servants that we now call today the patriarchs. Um, knowing that this is a historical narrative, it's important for us to understand that that means the whole text is to be understood as a historical narrative. Uh, secondly, a quick reading of the text, which we now can look at as a historical narrative, and specifically Genesis 6 on through 9, where we get our flood narrative, gives us a noticeably clear image of a global catastrophic flood that wipes away all of humanity and all of the beasts and land along with it. The text out, outright, excuse me, declares things like the whole earth was covered, everything under the heaven was covered, all flesh um, that moved upon the earth was destroyed, or all flesh died that moved upon the earth, depending on what translation you're reading, uh, so on and so forth. Um, in fact, exhausting the language to describe a worldwide catastrophe in Noah's time. <clears throat> The text of no place seems to suggest any locality to the flood at all. And I would, in fact, challenge not only Rob, but anybody who believes in the local flood to tell us how God could have possibly communicated that there was a global flood if indeed he did not do so in the book of Genesis. Uh, just to read a couple of passages. So, for example, Genesis 6 and 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Notice a couple things about this verse alone. Uh, number one, he's destroying all of man. He's saying he wants to destroy man, not a particular nation, not a particular region, not a particular tribal group or the Nephilim or anything like that. He wants to destroy all of man. He also is going to destroy beast and creeping thing, fowls of the air, so on and so forth. So this is going to be impacting more than just the human population and it's apparently supposed to be impacting uh, them in such a ubiquitous manner that he doesn't have to localize them or specify in any sort of way. Go on to Genesis 7, starting at verse 18. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. This one's a very interesting one because it's the one that I don't think could possibly be argued as symbolic or metaphorical and definitively proves that this is a literal passage, verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. Again, exhausting the language to prove that this is in some way a global catastrophe. And again, I would say that uh, verse in and of itself, in my opinion, is a Mount Impassable and not the only one. Uh, continuing, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and of every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in dry land died. You may notice I'm reading out of a King James Version, but go ahead and pick out any version you like. You will get the exact same communication because it says that in the original Hebrew. You can move on again to Genesis 8. Uh, Noah, starting at verse 18, Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind kinds went forth out of the ark. Once again, exhaustive language to build, to make the point um, that uh, every single animal, all the earth, all the high hills, everything under heaven, so on and so forth. And we could, of course, go on. Uh, but this isn't even actually the worst part. It actually gets worse if one exam examines, excuse me, I cannot talk today, certain absurdities that are created when one takes a local deluge position. For example, as popularly noted by Christian apologist Kent Hovind, God makes Noah embark on an incredibly long and painstaking mission, namely building the ark and bringing all the animals two by two to one place, when he could have just have easily told Noah to move and pick up his effects and just move on with his life. Another example, God has Noah bring all the animals two by two onto the ark with the stated goal of replenishing a depleted earth 
despite the fact that every single animal in the region would have a perfectly stable population, not a few miles northeast and west of the flood site. Uh, most local flooders will take the position of the Persian Gulf, which I believe is my opponent's position today, but I won't straw man anything. Uh, but if that is the case, then that flood comes up from the south, meaning they have stable populations in literally every other direction. Then there is, of course, the honestly kind of ridiculous notion of God providing for us a rainbow as a sign that he would never do that thing that he kind of habitually does to China once every 50 to 100 years or so, namely send a local flood that decimates a given population center. One might be tempted to use the argument, okay, but what if we only think he used this flood to destroy all of humanity, not just a given population center? And that could work if it wasn't for the fact that you're now picking and choosing which parts of the current scientific uh, consensus you're taking. Um, nobody in the current scientific consensus believes that all of humanity was in the same place 10,000 years ago. In fact, the current scientific consensus suggests that we have, and archaeological and historical as well, this is not stuff that I necessarily believe, by the way, but it is what they suggest, uh, that we had people living in China, the Indus Valley, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and both upper and lower Mesopotamia by 10,000 BC, um, meaning that this flood would have to happen significantly farther back than that. And of course, that gets us to a whole bunch of problems, genealogically speaking, considering the fact that we're given pretty uh, straightforward numbers that tell us the time when the flood occurred. Um, I think the, the, the covenant here is another one of these Mount in, uh, Impassables, if you will. And I really want to emphasize how ridiculous I think this covenant is, which I say respectfully, by the way, if we are going to take a local deluge position. Uh, it must be noted that regardless of how catastrophic the floods uh, might have been in the Persian Gulf area, there has been tons and tons and tons of floods much more catastrophic than anything anybody has ever seen in China, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in the Pacific Islands, and so on and so forth, all throughout human history that would make any flood that anybody saw in the Persian Gulf look pedantic and quite frankly ridiculous. On top of that, all of these floods would be happening under the watchful eye of God. And if God is indeed sovereign, he would be at least in some way permitting them all of them, or excuse me, permitting all of them to take place. Meaning the rainbow covenant would be laughable and outright lie and an example of the reason why you should not serve the God known as Jehovah, God of Israel, because he does not keep his word. He does not keep his covenants. Now, I, of course, do not believe that, but the position I think is quite clear. God gave us this covenant so that we would understand he would never again destroy the entire world as he had done, precisely as he told us. Uh, if this is not the position we're going to take, like I said, we run into certain absurdities, not just with this particular covenant, but also with taking two by two of every kind, despite having stable populations mere miles away, um, the exhausting of the language here, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go ahead and straw man anything, so there's a lot of things that I'll go ahead and wait for, wait for the position to actually be presented. But nonetheless, that's my position. That's what I hold to. Um, I do want to point out very quickly two things before I end. Number one, we do need to understand and ask ourselves the question, uh, is the Bible the holy and undisputed, excuse me, the holy and um, unadulterated word of the living God, or is it not? Is it meant for all people at all places at all times, or is it not? If the answer to those questions is yes, then the poor Irish peasant farmer from the 15th century needs to be able to understand it just as well as the 21st century English erudite. This is supposed to be saving both of them. It's supposed to be communicating to both of them. It's supposed to be presented by a God who created and wishes to have relationship with both of them. If, on the other hand, this is something that we need to understand in a more academic way, the same way we understand Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh and things of that nature, I would ask, what exactly are we doing here? Uh, I can understand what we would be doing here in an academic standpoint, from an academic standpoint, right? Maybe we like myths, maybe we like history, maybe we like ancient texts. But as religious believers, what exactly are we doing here if this text is something that we need very wise <clears throat> gurus who can only exist at certain places uh, and in certain times to understand the scriptures. And the second thing that I would point out, I'm not 100% sure how much time I have left, uh, yeah, but the second thing... Yeah, your time actually expired. That little, I meant to tell you guys that little chime is your one minute warning. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah, your time did expire already. Okay, um, so then I'll just finish up with very briefly saying 
Um, I would want to reiterate the question, uh, how could God have possibly communicated a global flood if he did not indeed do so through Genesis? And then I would yield and uh, thank you very much for the time. All right, all right. Oh, didn't mean to go there, Robert. You up, you up, Robert, for your 10-minute opening statement. Let me know when you're ready and I'll start your time. Okay, I'll um, I'll share my my what do you call it screen. All right. <clears throat> okay. Let me know that's up and clear. It is up and clear. All right. Thanks for that, CJ. Uh, I think a lot that you shared. We can definitely have a nice discussion about those points in the um, cross examination. Um, this is actually a, a an 88 slide <laughs> presentation I made uh, about two three years ago, but I'm not going to go through all 88. I don't have, you know, I need more than 10 minutes for that. But so I'll be very brief. Um, so based on on the research that I've conducted and in light of the, uh, the you know the scholarship that's that's out there, the 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 best understanding in regards to the ancient past and how people understood their environment in the ancient past, you know, this thing we call the ancient Near East. This is probably the most illustration of, of perspective, which then the the, um, the book of Genesis, specifically from the first chapter, has to uh, work with, uh, with, with that sort of model in mind. So as you can see, you have like, like a temple here, but then everything is sort of enclosed in this local environment. There's the pillars, there's Leviathan, there's the dome, there's the windows and dome, and, and that's Yahweh's temple up here and, and all that stuff. And notice you have the rivers flowing around. And this is this, this image is to connotate completeness. Uh, this graph here, though, is to sort of, you know, fast forward five, 6,000 years later, and you're reaching into the 21st century, and a much different perspective arises about the chronology of Earth's history, and I'm suggesting from a from an old Earth concordance point of view that you can actually concord the days as epochs and an aligning with these events in Earth's history. So that being said, I'm gonna obviously I'm gonna argue for a, a local flood, and this is how I'm gonna do it. I'm actually gonna go uh, with the concordance approach. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with the ancient Near Eastern cosmology. Uh, rather, what I'm what I'm suggesting is Let's just, for the sake of argument, also read it with a modern lens, a modern scientific lens. And sure enough, Genesis passage does initiate itself as saying that the Earth once was a water world. And then you have a single landmass appearing. The scientists called this ore about three billion years ago. Graph basically showing that, like halfway through, you have a a, a sudden increase in landmass appearing up like that. And uh, basically, uh, here is an illustration. So in, in this case, you do have, I guess you could say, like a, a, a global flood. <laughs> Not flood, but basically a water well that then becomes the Earth. Now, I don't just rely on Genesis. I also rely on practically all the scripture to interpret itself. So Psalm 104 actually gives a chronology of, first, there was the primeval ocean that existed, and then finally, when you have tectonic uplift, then the the waters that once covered the whole globe will never again cover the earth. And this is David's paraphrase of Genesis one. And you have other creation passages that basically say the same thing. Job thirty eight speaks about the sea having limits, there's a boundary, and God Himself saying that you can only come this far and no more. Your majestic waves will stop. Even in Proverbs eight, you have the same thing. Uh, when he set a boundary for the sea so the waters would not exceed his limits. Jeremiah 5, which is quite interestingly an uh, apocalyptic uh, perspective, even in, over here it says, I'm the one who put the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier. So in, in, you know, it's, it's thinking back to the Genesis 1 scenario and, and basically saying it, perpetual, the, the Hebrew is literally olam. So think of olam here as a type of eternity. Um, so though the waves toss, they cannot prevail against it. Though they roar, they cannot cross it. So, uh, I'm going to skip these slides. It's basically all about the fact that there's a deluge 
uh, what's unclean flood that showcases the the pathway of the water that goes right into the Persian Gulf region. And the argument I'm trying to make is that Noah's flood is actually the Persian Gulf. And I'm trying to show a topological overlay as to why I believe it's this region. Uh, just making, okay, I've got five minutes left. So I argue that Genesis 1 is speaking about humanity, generally speaking, in, in Africa. And in Genesis 2, they migrate into the Persian Gulf. Uh, here's some studies done by Jeffrey Rose, where he shows migration patterns and so on. And basically, and here's some evidence in regards to some blades dating to about 70,000 years and all that. Basically, um, it was an oasis. There was no Persian Gulf. And so suddenly... Oh, and, and, and these slides is all about the fact that uh, the Genesis 2 passage gets into that, like, the, you know, it, it describes the conditions of that particular region in very accurate detail. And so uh, notice here, I'm proud of Eden is here at the head of Euphrates River, Tigris, the Pishon, and the Gihon East over here, and they meet over here. And there was no Persian Gulf at the time. But... Suddenly, during the Younger Dryas event, this is about 12,000 uh, years ago. Uh, so initially you have, so this is what it looked like. Notice there's no Persian Gulf. But then, after all these, you know, analysis of, um, we're talking about coastal lands landscapes and homeland dispersals and precipitation levels and, and all that stuff, there was a paper that was published that actually, and this, and this is a quotation from that paper in 2015, that showcases a massive deluge. There's a dam. So here's the Indian Ocean. The dam spilled over, and during the Younger Dryas event as well, this is at the onset of the Holocene period. So this is at the end of the Ice Age. So here's the initial conditions of the, of the region. Then you have a spillage. And if basically if Noah is say around here, which a lot of the engineers and scholars believe where Nod is, you know, from Genesis 4 moving forward. Like basically, where are they located when the, the events of Genesis 6 takes place? Then that may, you know, notice that Ararat uh, and Uratu and, and Judy, Mount Judy, these, these are all regions in traditions with respect to the Ark's landing, and it's all up here. So this is a very natural... Uh, very logical, in fact, um, that uh, the arc basically floats in that direction up here. And as Genesis said, it gets that, that there's a swage away, then, then you get Persian Gulf. So from as an apologetic value, I can suggest that um, if we were to go to the Persian Gulf, I could point to an atheist and say, hey, you're looking at the face. If, if you could, you know, you know, today's in regards to the elf, I'm proposing that um, it's a reed boat, and I'm just looking for particularly any slides on that. I mean, I, I get into the type of creatures that survive in the ark and don't survive. Um, I'm proposing that Job actually gives the list of species, because Job in this particular reed actually highlights specifically what's over there. Uh, so obviously, I don't believe in dinosaurs surviving on the ark and and all of that stuff. Um, I think I'll end it with this quote over here by by uh, Michael Heiser in his Unseen Realm from a linguistic point of view. He says, "Our concern is with the biblical text and its own evidence for a local flood. First, the phrase in the flood narrative that suggests a global event occur a number of times in the Hebrew Bible where their context cannot be global or include all people on the planet. So, for example, the phrase the whole earth, call Eretz, occurs in passages that clearly speak of localized geography. In such cases, whole land or all the people in the area are better and understandings. These options produce a regional flood event if used in Genesis 6 to 8 where the phrase occurs. And just also to clarify, when Heiser gets into the Watchers and the Sons of God and the Nephilim stuff. In Genesis 6 verse 4, you actually have them 
being described as surviving the flood. So the question is, where did they migrate to? And in Second Temple literature, they migrate to Canaan, basically Mount Hermon. Isn't it interesting that uh, that's precisely why Joshua's wars happen the way they do? Because God still has to eradicate them out. And so he uses Israel as a vehicle to eradicate them. But, but they still survive that. In Joshua 11, uh, you have a few that migrate to Gath. And sure enough, uh, Gath, that's where Goliath is. Uh, finally, Heiser says that uh, in Genesis 9.19, you have the sons of Noah populating, not the entire planet, but basically just the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean. So that's that's what you would call the table of nations. And then finally, in the last few seconds here, notice he quotes Psalm 104 verse 9, um, because he's a Hebrew scholar, and he basically says, look, this basically does communicate that it forbids a, a global flood. And I'll end with that. All right, thank you, Robert, for that opening statement. All right, now it's time for rebuttal. CJ, you're up for your five-minute rebuttal. Let me know when you're ready, and I'll start your time. <clears throat> Absolutely, thank you. Just one second. All right, I am ready. So, <clears throat> a couple things I want to briefly reiterate before I get to some rebuttal stuff. I just want to briefly reiterate the things that I think are what I will call Mount Impassables for the Old Earth position. Number one, exhaustive language. I would again like to challenge how could God have communicated a global flood if he wanted to, if indeed he did not do so in Genesis 6 through 9. Number two, the Noahic covenant. Uh, God has flooded the world numerous different times if we're only talking about catastrophic, localized, and regional floods. And then... Uh, the number three point that I wanted to point out, of course, was the uh, hills being covered 15 cubits upward, a statement which not only does it not appear to be metaphorical in any way, but also appears to very clearly indicate that the entire flood or the entire world rather was flooded. I also want to reiterate a couple of the other points I made, namely that I think this is the um, inspired word of God for all peoples at all times, meaning it should be able to be understood both by a peasant from the 16th century, as well as an erudite from the 21st, um, as well as the fact that there are certain absurdities, I think I already pointed out the Noahic covenant one, but also um, the whole, you know, taking two by two each animal when there is totally stable populations elsewhere, and so on and so forth, right? So just to remind everybody a little bit of some of the positions that I laid out. Now to get to some of the stuff I want to rebut, uh, first let's start, I think, with Psalm 104.9. Now, it is interesting, I have to point out, and this is something that is quite common amongst um, people who believe in uh, old earth creation or uh, intelligent design or um, anything along those lines, which I say with respect, by the way, I'm not saying that as an insult. However, they tend to take passages which literary critics, um, or in books rather, which literary critics don't tend to take seriously, or literally might be a better way to put it. Uh, over ones which literary critics do suggest are to be taken literally. Uh, what do I mean by that? So Psalm, obviously, by is indicated by its very name, is a poem, right? Psalms, by their very nature, are metaphorical, allegorical, parabolic, so on and so forth. It's the very nature of writing poetry and music. Um, Genesis, on the other hand, is nearly universally understood to be communicating a historical narrative. Obviously, if it's not communicating a historical narrative, then where do we get the Abrahamic covenant? How did the Jews end up in Goshen? Where did all these tribes show up? And what happened there at the, uh, um, at Nim uh, not Nimrod's table of, uh, or council of whatever it is, the Tower of Babel, excuse me, because uh, that's actually a, a misconception. But you guys get the idea, right? All these different historical details um, that later historical narratives actually rely upon being uh, true and literal history. So we're not going to take that seriously, even though it's almost near, uh, almost universally understood to be literal history, but we do want to take Psalm as literal, even though Psalms by their very nature are metaphorical and parabolic. I just find it to be a little interesting. It happens all the time. Uh, they, people do it often with Job as well, right? Job is understood by many, uh, literary critics to be, um, actually fictional. Uh, Job and Esther, as well as Jonah have been suggested by many, to be uh, what you might call holy fiction. I don't believe that. I'm just simply pointing out the inconsistency 
considering what we're talking about literarily. Uh, now, what does Psalm 104.9 actually say? Uh, to read the NIV, you said a boundary they cannot, they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. Talking about the waters. Uh, you said a firm boundary for the seas, so they would never again cover the earth. You said a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. And of course, so on and so forth. You can read it in all of the different passages. There are cross-references you can use. Most of them are going to be used in Proverbs and the book of Job. I would suggest people go and look this up on the Strongs, and they'll be able to see it for themselves. Uh, however, there is no point in, uh, in time where this is actually clearly demarcating this happening at the point of creation. Um, this is rather is talking about Genesis as a whole. And by the way, if we were to take it literally as referring to creation, it would fly in the face of other texts, which we are to be taking literally, such as the Noahic covenant. God says at that point in time that he will never again flood the earth or destroy the earth as he has done, as he actually says. Uh, the other problem I would want to quickly point out as a brief inconsistency is taking the modern scientific uh, consensuses to be true in various different things, but not in regards to civilization. What do I mean by that? Well, the idea of a flood being universal, but not necessarily global, is that it impacts all human beings, right? The problem is we know human beings had not actually, or had uh, lived in regions outside of Mesopotamia, uh, at least we know, quote unquote, right? I, again, I don't necessarily buy into this, but this is the current scientific consensus. Um, in regions outside of all Mesopotamia, right. Right, no CJ, that's, that's time right there, CJ. Okay. That's time right there. All right, Robert, you're up for your five minute rebuttal. Uh, let me know when you're ready and I'll start your time. Yep. All right, you got it. Um, to be honest, I actually agree with a lot <laughs> that CJ is sharing. Uh, well, specifically in light of his, uh, his admonition for uh, respecting and having reverence for the Bible and, you know, the faith and, and all of that. Um, but I think, I think uh, the top three points that he made that I think I could, I could answer in the short time would be uh, how could God communicate a local flood? Or if he was to communicate some form of local flood, like, like from my perspective or some form of clear story about the flood, in the Genesis 6 to 9 scenario. And then another one, which I think is a good question, is that Noah's covenant and the rainbow. But what is the meaning behind that? And then a really, a really interesting one, the hills being covered by 15 cubits. So the first one, um, how could God communicate a local flood? I find it curious that you have three scenarios going on in, in Genesis 1 to 11. So you, uh, and, and again, in the scholarship, you have it described as proto-history. So Genesis 1 to 3 sets up the, the scenario of, well, 3 is the culmination of Genesis 1 to 2. It sets up the scenario of what God, what God does with his creation and in the ancient Near East, again, if you're talking about the perspicuity of scripture or the clarity of scripture to an ancient audience, they're thinking ancient Near East. So we have to respect that. Uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, it, you know, that doesn't put God down or uh, in fact, it honors God exactly with the, uh, the requirements that CJ is asking us to have. And that is how is God glorified regardless of the era that you're in. So yeah, you had this God's cosmic temple, which is a creation. Then you have an introduction to sin of sin into this temple. So you have a fall in Genesis three. Then you have another fall in Genesis six. Then you have another fall in Genesis eleven. Now Genesis six to eleven, therefore, uh, is a complete package. Now, all the ancient Near Eastern creation myths have a flood thing going on. Genesis 11 is not global. It's a localized event, notice, in the same Persian Gulf region. That's where the Ziggurat Tower of Babel is being built, Babylon. So just, just by comparing the two passages, that's how I know it's a localized thing because you have this flooding taking place, God making a covenant. Now, in this case, answering the second question, the rainbow, therefore, 
they had a rainbow deity, most not not specifically rainbow as we think of it as, but but more so to do with think of it like a weapon. And in this case, uh, God's not going to judge the gods. In this case, the sons of God, the Watchers of Genesis six, um, in the same way next time. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. He he, he you know he keeps his promise. Um, so it's this bow like ancient Near Eastern bow like language that's connected to that. And sure enough, when he judges the Tower of Babel, you know, people, it says all the earth was speaking one language. Notice that universal language, but it still is. Therefore, the third point about the hills being covered by 15 cubits, it's interesting about symmetry here because the, uh, the arc has a height of 30 cubits. Notice 15 cubits is basically half the height. And Hebrew scholars will point this out. So Gordon Wenham, for example, in his World Biblical Commentary and, and a few others will say that um, when it speaks about covering, it's actually not saying that it's covering from the top of the mountain up 30 cubits. Because if you think about it, even the highest mountain, right? Because the arc is 30, the 15 will make do just so that the arc sort of scrapes just over the top of the mountain, if you want to see it that way. But that's our modern perspective or our modern ship ocean, oceanographic physics coming into play. That in the Hebrew, you can literally translate it as the mountains were covered up 15 cubits, or they were dressed up to 15 cubits. And in this case, the hills and so on. And as I showed you in that map, if, if the entire Persian Gulf indeed was flooded, and sure enough, 15 cubits is about 22 and a half feet, you're to basically, it looks like the whole everywhere is flooded, but it's still local. So. All right, Robert, that's time yeah. right there. All right, guys, we are jumping into the most, the favorite part of every debate, cross-examination, man. And I feel this is going to be a great one. So once again, this is a 40-minute cross-examination. Both of you will get 20 minutes to ask questions, starting with CJ. You're up first for your 20-minute cross-examination of Robert Rue. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and I think dive into some of them. There will be some good ones here for sure. Um, so the first question I would want to ask is about um, the text itself. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's not the subject of debate. Um, but within the text of Scripture is the claim that at least the core nucleus of the Torah goes back to Moses. Now, there are certain passages which indicate something has been added to that. For example, Joshua adds to the book of the law, so on and so forth. But at least the core nucleus is said to go back to Moses, which would put the penmanship, if you take a early date at about 1400 BC, if you take a late date at about 1200 BC, either way, real long time ago. Um, would you affirm that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I I was on the fence as far as the Exodus goes, but you know, I recently interviewed David Falk, and uh, yeah, this is it's not part of the debate topic, but I'm right. I'm now uh, I'm a late dates proponent now. So yeah, but either way, I'm I'm still a conservative as far as Moses author, mosaic authorship. I get, but I get, again, you know me, like I I nuance that by saying I'm not afraid or shy to be open-minded about uh, redactional criticism. In other words, editors through God's providence to work with the text. For example, Josiah's reform of the law after the exile, like stuff like that. I, I'm, God, let, let God be true and every man a lie, that sort of thing, so. Right. Yeah. So then uh, with that being said then, so I uh, would wanna go back to um, the claim about this being sort of like a refutation of a rainbow deity. Um, now, I don't know which one you're referring to in particular, but I do know that um, there is a goddess known as Manzat in Sumerian mythology. Is that the one that you're referring to? I'm bringing it up right now. Let me just bring it up. But yeah, you can, if you want, you can continue your point. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Monzat is, if my understanding is correct, 
uh, to be the same as Tirana or the Bow of Heaven. Um, and worship of Manzat was primarily in uh, Elamite and Mesopotamian literature, uh, um, <clears throat> which would be sometime around, if our understanding is correct, uh, 2000-ish BC, obviously a significant time before Moses. Um, now, obviously, we could make some claim of this, that, and the other thing, which is why I asked you what time you would put the writing of Moses in. But even with what we agree on, which is that Moses did write the core nucleus of the Torah, we're still some six to eight hundred years removed from worship of this particular deity. On top of that, we're something like a thousand miles removed from worship of this particular deity, coming from a region farther to the west of the worship of this particular deity. Um, in other words, it just seems kind of pedantic and pointless to present any sort of a polemic against this particular deity. So why would God go out of his way to respond to a Mesopotamian deity, despite the fact that these deities wouldn't be present, not only in the culture he's leaving, the Egyptians, but also in the culture he's going to, the Canaanites? Ah, because, um, because Genesis, okay, so the ancient Near East obviously is well before Moses. And even if you have texts, um, I'm, I'm just being very short here, but even if you have texts like, say, Daniel and Ezekiel, uh, they are having to deal with mythologies that um, pre-exist Moses. Um, and, and again, don't forget, it, even, even if Daniel and Ezekiel are in the 500s, 600s BC period, which is up, well after Moses, um, the religion and the cuneiform texts of that period are still harking back to a very ancient memory. And so, like in Ezekiel 14, when it speaks about the wisdom of uh, Job, Noah, and now this is where it gets interesting, right? Is it Daniel or Dan L? Now, I, I take the Dan L view. I know there are faithful ancient Near Eastern scholars who are Christian who say, no, 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 it's Daniel, a contemporary of Ezekiel. But I find Dan L a very interesting reading in light of your question where you have pre-mosaic figures. So Job, obviously, if you, if, you, if you hold to the authorship of Job as being very early, um, Job is pre-Moses, Noah's pre-Moses. This Dan L figure is definitely pre-Moses. So therefore, remember when I said Genesis 1 to 11 is this proto-history, because Israel's history actually starts in Genesis 12 with Abraham. So therefore, Moses then is the final editor uh, with respect to this thing we call the Torah, where he includes, you know, Genesis into this thing we call the Torah. And then, and then you have, I guess, fine tuning events of the Genesis story post Moses, you know, in, in small areas. Um, now the deity of the bow uh, is not the particular deity that you mentioned. It's actually the deity Quos, uh, Q-O-S, it's an Akkadian deity, and it does have all that with uh, Ethiopic and Canaanite. And so I'm reading from the Dictionary of Deities and Demons. They say um, this Quos figure was, it was a deified, became a deified weapon of the weather god, hence compared with Genesis 9.13, or a war god, um, and it, it, it became then this culmination of kind of like deified divine weapons or tools, also known in Ugarit. And then it says, um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then read. So, the, so John Walton then says, in the Gilgamesh epic, the goddess Ishtar identifies the lapis lazuli of her necklace as the basis of an oath by which she will never forget the days of the flood. The, this cost is connected to that thing, this, this, this bow-like thing, right? And also notice necklace is like a rainbow shape as well. So the bees of the necklace are in the shape of flies and, and thus reminiscent of the way the gods swarmed like flies around the sacrifice offered by Utnapishtim. And again, so don't forget, Noah sets up. Yeah? Mm-hmm. 
Sorry, I, I just want to. I just gotta break in a little bit, just because. So, um, <clears throat> so Kos time, is, is going yeah. to be a um, primarily Edomite deity, actually, because I know that because he's actually he's actually in the Bible a couple of times, uh, and interestingly enough, there are uh, references to him directly in Ezra and Nehemiah, but you notice that those are nearly a thousand years after. Moses is said to have lived. If you take an early date, it is exactly a thousand years after Moses is said to live. So you run into a similar problem. I feel like with that, if you're taking the position that he's responding to the to Manzat, which would be the rainbow deity from Sumer, then worship of this deity ceased by the time Moses is around. And if you're taking the position that it's Kos, then worship of this deity hasn't actually started by the time that Moses is around. Um, and in fact, I, I'd be, I would be willing to bank on the fact that the people who believe this is a response to Kos are more than likely thinking that this is some sort of a deuterom, uh, deuteromistic uh, conglomeration of texts, as most people do today, taking the documentary hypothesis to say this was around the time of Josiah that everybody set up the Torah, right? Um, and that I would almost, uh, not being super familiar with the theory, don't get me wrong, but I would, I would be willing to bet a paycheck, honestly, on that being a key and fundamental part of them saying, hey, this is a polemic against this particular deity, because it's a deity that we do have direct references to in the Bible, and they're post-exilic. It's very far into the future. Um, the Edomites before this time are worshiping deities like uh, Hamash, for example, who is also found in Moabite religion. Uh, we see worship of Baal, who's commonly thought to be Baal Hadad, um, but it, it, not this coast deity, right? And it's also important to point out that Kos isn't actually a deity of rainbows. He's a archer deity, much like Apollo. Um, just like it would be kind of a stretch to say Apollo is a rainbow deity, it would equally be a little bit of a stretch to say that Kos is a rainbow deity. He is a deity of the bow, certainly. In fact, the word Kos means bow, even in the Hebrew language. Um, but of the rainbow, I don't think that that would actually work, unless we're putting the book of Genesis much further into the future than it actually is, um, which... You know, we had just previously established, we agree, it's actually to be, uh, at least the core nucleus of it, written at Moses' time. And the additions, even, not a lot that long after Moses' time, right? Joshua adds in the Book of the Law, well, that's a direct contemporary of Moses right after he dies. Um, the rabbis have suggested Samuel might have added to the Tanakh. Well, that's still only um, a couple hundred years after Moses has died. The point still being... We have a polemic against a deity that Moses doesn't interact with. It doesn't really make any sense. Like, why doesn't he use this to to create a polemic or uh, God to speak through him to create a polemic against, say, the Egyptian deities or Molech, right? Molech gets nothing but a passing mention in Leviticus about how you don't sacrifice your gods to him, even though he's a deity who they're going to be speaking with constantly, or not speaking with, but dealing with constantly for the next six, seven, eight hundred years. But we have this polemic for a deity that we're not going to find for another eight, seven hundred years in the future. Doesn't that seem a little bit odd? Mm. And and those final points you're making actually is kind of proving my point when I carefully was talking about the uh, the uh, the open mindedness I have about the redactional aspect of the text. Um, because don't forget, the Jews are in exile. And so someone like, even like Michael Heiser will actually bring this out. So the Genesis 1 to 11, that this thing called proto-history becomes even more fine-tuned by the time you reach Babylonian stuff and, and perspectives of life and religion and so on. So now I'm not saying that that Kos, and I could be mispronouncing it as well, <laughs> but that Q-O-S deity is mm -hmm. only being depicted in Genesis 9. What I'm it, like the deity, the diction of deities and demons actually says CF Genesis nine. It's it's compared to that, and then the reason why I was reading Walton, which I'll quickly finish now with with what he was saying. He's saying, look, you already have an ancient Near Eastern account, hence the Gil the Gilgamesh epic, yeah. uh, with Utnapishtim, which is obviously way back, and you already have. Um, a, a buildup of a narrative. Now he's going to say these traditions diverge from a common core. And, and in, in other words, I'm thankful that he's saying that because you have the critics who have a liberal agenda, obviously you and I would agree, agree with, on that. They, mm -hmm. um, they wanted to, you know, they want to say that the, oh, look, because you have these traditions, that means Genesis is just a myth. 
no, the fact that you have these traditions means it, it, it authenticates this historicity about the events. So Walton says, uh, he's, he's in his commentary, starting off with this thing called a necklace, right? The swarming of flies around the sacrifice is interesting because, again, think like an ancient Near Eastern person. Flies in the distance, sacrifice, it looks like, like you know, rain. But then at the same time, what is, whenever you have rain, there's a rainbow. Um, and so Noah, in this case, is doing a sacrifice. Obviously, flies would be part of that. And then this thing known as the bow emerges. And so then he says that, uh, so Kilmer suggests that a connection exists between Ishtar's necklace and the rainbow is the iridescence of the flies' wings. And then uh, in conclusion, he says, 11th century Assyrian, now notice 11th century, so practically around the time of Moses in the sense, um, Assyrian relief shows two hands reaching out of the clouds, one hand offering blessing, the other holding a bow. And since the word for bow, and he he puts like a slash rainbow bow, and there's the the cassette, but he basically is saying when you do an etymological connection, because cos and and that is like it means that, right? You have the roots right for mm-hmm. bow, right? And hence the cost deity with the bow stuff. But he then says, look, since the word is the same word as that used for the weapon. This is an interesting image. This comparison and ones like it suggests the possibility that these two traditions diverge from a common core. So yeah, and that and that's where I'm going with this. Like, I if if I were to tease out the elements of the story uh, in hindsight of the Babylonian exile uh, as as a as a final sort of message of. You guys have your myths. We have our "quote unquote" myths. At the end of the day, when you do a comparative religious thing between all the texts, obviously the Genesis account not only comes out much more historically valid in hindsight of the sciences I was proposing in my presentation, but uh, it just shows how much bigger and greater and grander and majestic Yahweh is compared to, you know, their deities. Um, well, I even think that sometimes yeah. you do absolutely have polemic in the Bible. I do want to be, be clear. For example, I think the most obvious polemic in the Bible is um, the uh, the title for God, or not God, excuse me, the devil, Lord of the Flies, right? Because uh, it's it's a play on on a name that he was actually being given. And they so they call him, um, I, I think, if I remember correctly, Baal Zebub is Lord of the Flies. Yeah, about- um, Baal, yeah, it's, it's either Baal Zebul that becomes Baal Zebub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The A and yeah. E interchange. And, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or or how they call, um, rather than calling Babel Babylim, as everybody else did, they call it Babil, meaning confusion, right? And once again, making a pun. Mm-hmm. So obviously that, that does exist in the scripture for sure. The problem, I think, is with everything you've said, we still have Moses responding to a deity that doesn't exist in, in his world yet, right? Um, or or could potentially not exist in his world anymore. Um, I think that, and it's, it is interesting, we know that, you know, you have this uh, uh, Akkadian deity, or did you say Akkadian or Assyrian? Uh, well, he's, well, Walton says 11th century Assyrian relief. This is, again, he's just yeah. throwing another random example that there's this relief that shows right. a, a, a covenant blessing in in. That's with respect to clouds and rain, and in one hand, and and a bow in the other. And again, this is a part of that. But notice, notice what that does yeah. rely on, and both Walton and Heiser would actually take a position contrary to what me and you have both affirmed in this video, namely that Moses wrote the Torah. Uh, I, and Heiser has outright said he believes the majority of the Torah was penned by somebody else, even though he doesn't believe the documentary hypothesis. Um, which obviously flies in the face of certain other clear scriptures. And though it's not the point of this video, since we agree on it, it is interesting to point out that he's saying, oh, see, we have these Assyrian deities, and it does kind of seem like there's some similarities, but what's the inherent assumption there? Moses didn't actually write the Torah. Well, if we agree that Moses did write the Torah, then that inherent assumption is false. The foundation of the argument can no longer be held, right? And, And again, we still run into this problem of, the Kus deity being 
uh, presented to the Hebrews at a point in time that we can actually find um, because there are polemics uh, in the period directly before the exile for tons and tons and tons of, of false deities, right? You have a uh, Hamash, mm. you have Baal, which is commonly thought to be Baal Hadad. Uh, you have Ashtaroth, or Ashtaroth, excuse me. You have Asherah, which is the one I just kind of mixed that with. Um, you have um, obviously Molech, right? And, and so on and so forth. You can kind of just continue to go down the line here, but you don't have Kus yet. Right, Kus doesn't show up in the polemics until Ezra and Nehemiah, which are nearly 150 years after the Babylonian exile. So we can actually pinpoint exactly when it is that the Hebrew people are introduced to this deity, this bow deity, right? And it's a very long period of time after, um, after uh, Moses is, is said to have been around. And it relies, and this is the point I want to hammer home, it relies on the assumption that people like Ezra and Nehemiah we're actually penning the majority of the Bible after or during the exile, not beforehand. So if we're going to take the position that Scripture was actually written pre-exile, uh, or that the Torah was written in its nucleus by Moses, um, it seems to me like we've ob obliterated, frankly, uh, the the foundation for thinking that this Kus deity could be found uh, um, in this text. And that's not even including our clear indication of when exactly he's presented. Um I want to let you respond to that, but I noticed my time's getting low, and I wanted to ask one more question about the rainbow before we we continue there. Yep. I'm sure you'll have some good questions too. I'll just I'll uh, just based on that few seconds, I'll just say I'll speak on behalf of my uh, of Heiser here. He is, and I'll and 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 believe believe you me, like like I think you'll like this. Um, He's definitely a lot more conservative than you might think. <laughs> so he he when he, you know when you said. Majority of the Old Testament is written by no North. No, well, let's just let's just sort of like reverse that around, and, and let's just say he does believe in the in the authors as presented in the in the Old Testament as the authors, but he's open to what I just said, uh, editors later down the track. But they but they but they don't overrule the original authors. So he's a comp complementarian, I think he calls himself in that sense. But yeah, go 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 along with the question. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, so even, you know, with everything we just said, obviously I have a lot of dispute with your position, but let's assume that I took your position, that this is a polemic against a rainbow deity. Uh, how does the covenant itself work anyways? Because remember, the specific rules of the covenant are, I will not destroy uh, the earth as I have done, and the earth in, the, in your interpretation is this localized civilization of Noah. Um now, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but in the last 150 years alone, in China alone, we've had the 1931 China floods, which killed 500,000 to a million people, the 1887 Yellow River flood, which killed 2 million people, the 1838 um, Yellow River flood, which killed 800,000 people, uh, the Typhoon of Nina, which killed 229,000 people, and that is in one country. Uh, and it's not an exhaustive list of all of the floods that have killed over, over 50,000 people in China in the last 150 years. Um, hey, hey, guys, so, that's, that's time. That's time. That's your time, CJ, uh, okay. for your cross-examination. All right, Robert, you're up for your 20-minute cross-examination, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in my time. Um, again, try not so, – so this is how I would I would engage this. I'm wanting to take Genesis 1 to 11 as a complete package, as a buildup of things moving forward from Genesis 12 onwards. Uh, there's a lot. Like if you think about it, if, if, you, if, you were in, if, if you were in my perspective in regards to, say, old Earth, right, Big Bang, right? So that means the universe is 13 billion years old. Earth is 4 billion years old. To be more accurate, 13.8 billion years and 4.5 billion years. Humanity is at least 150, 200,000 years coming in from Africa or into the Persian Gulf. Um, and then Adam is is basically, and between Adam and Noah, that's basically between 70,000 and 15,000. And Noah's about 12,000 when all this happens. And then when he makes a vineyard and all that stuff, that's from about 10,000, so say 12,000 to 10,000 which then starts the ancient Near Eastern story because that's when proto-writing takes place and, pro, you know, this thing we call proto-history. 
which means the Tower of Babel would be, say, 8,000 years ago, something like that. And then the Egyptian empires kick in and all that. So that means you, you're truncating all that history from a concordance point of view. You're truncating Genesis 1 is basically the entire history of the planet Earth with respect to then the entire history of humanity in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 1 and basically all of chapter 2, right down into this thing we call the very peculiar Nephilim scenario in Genesis 6. And that in itself, known as the Adapa myth, that in itself has an ancient Near Eastern backstory and all that. And then God having to go... So in other words, think think like it, it goes from very big picture and it becomes narrow, 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 narrow. And then finally, Tower of Babel, still in the same Persian Gulf region. And then Abraham. Guess what? Where's Abraham? Or the Chaldeans, again, in the same Persian Gulf region. Everything's happening in the same region in, in those 11 chapters. So then the rainbow then, I've, we, as again Walton is getting at, when you're looking at this from a covenantal point of view, uh, it's all in connection with, um, again, what and I, you know, even what the Reformation scholars would call it as uh, salvation history. Um, this never again language is mostly to do with the fact that um, God's keeping a covenant with His, basically His people, His elect, so to speak. So. You, ha you see this contrast in Second Peter 3, um, where, now if I take Peter literally in the Greek there, when he says the world at that time was flooded, well, you have a qualifier. Cosmos there is qualified with tote to mean not that the, the globe was flooded, but, but humanity at, at, in that region was flooded. Oh, Rob, and then he contrasts it with... Hey, Rob, I hate to interrupt, but I do yep. want you to start asking Rob, uh, CJ some questions um, so he can okay. Uh, okay. Deal, with, deal with your position. Okay. Um, so then, Mike, yeah, in fact, based on everything I just said there, like, what goes through your mind when I explain it that way? Is, is it interesting? Um, do you agree with me that we should look at the Genesis narrative in its complete whole to then... So in other words, when you look at the rainbow thing, you have to keep in mind about the geographical location in Genesis 2, all, you know, all that stuff. Like, how do you react with to, to that? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Uh, the first thing is um, I am... I, I do believe, obviously, the Bible needs to be taken in its textual context. Um, I think when people try to force it into its historical context, quote unquote, and I add quote unquote because I think we are assuming we know the historical context when in reality, a lot of times it's often obscure to us. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think you create a problem of basically turning the text into a run of the mill myth from the Middle East. Uh, and my reason for believing that just to be brief is, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, was Moses talking to Hebrews or was God talking to believers, right? Because if Moses is talking to Hebrews, then it makes a lot of sense for us to hyper-focus on the context of everything going on, just as we would any other text, just as we would the Iliad and the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enuma Elish and, um, you know, the uh, Analects that have Confucius and so on and so forth, right? But if it's God communicating to believers, then not only do the people that Moses is talking to need to understand it, but also the people in 500 AD in a peasant farm in China need to understand it. And the people in 16th century mm -hmm. AD in a peasant farm in Ireland need to be able to understand it. And people, you know, and this is one thing that I think we, we get into a really big problem when we start to try to add all this. Well, if you know the language and you add the historical context and you know of this obscure deity that, you know, ceased worship in 1500 BC or something like that, then you come to a, a, quote, proper understanding. Well, that's how I expect to understand texts that, I, sure, I'm interested in, but I don't afford any divine status. And again, like the Enuma Elise. So just, just a quick, but, but just a quick observation there. I, and I know I'm meant to be asking questions, so I'll try and, you know, formulate it as a question. Uh, our Catholic friends, uh, they very well 
will have high regard for Mary, right? And guess what? So my question is why? I mean, when you said about the persecuting of scripture, which I agree with, but why do they abuse the text? Like they look at Ezekiel 44 and, and, and so on as speaking about Mary, like, the gate of the temple will, will remain shut. Only the Lord can walk through the gate, the east gate in, in Ezekiel 44. And then they're like, oh, look, see, that's a perpetual virginity of Mary. And you see this in the patristic writings as well. Like, it, notice that these are people, they're human just as you and me, making argumentation based on what they know. Like, would, would you agree with me on, on those points? Certainly, but, but I think one thing that you'll notice um, when it comes to in, uh, interpretations that, and I won't necessarily say this is a, a universal rule for sure, because there has been times when I think consensus in regards to the scripture was, was actually terrible. For example, consensus in the West for something like 1100 years was that it was totally cool for the state to execute non-believers for the sake of their soul. I don't think the Bible supports that, but it came from Augustinian doctrine. The point not being about that, the point just being that there, it's certainly possible for consensus to come to the wrong conclusion. But usually, I think what when you start to see regional interpretations, right? So, for example, um, the interpretation we currently have today, uh, right, of a local flood, that is regional to the Western, not only uh, world today as far as uh, geographic uh, geographically, but it's also unique to our period in time, starting really with the fundamentalist modernist controversy and forward. Um, for the most part, not only did most of the church fathers and early rabbis, as well as reformers and so on, not take this position, uh, but even people who were not related to the Bible at all, like Herodotus, Xenophanes, and so on, uh, believed that there was a, a time when the whole world was actually covered. In fact, Xenophanes very famously uh, could be considered the first paleontologist because he uh, concluded on the basis of finding seashells on uh, different mountains in his travels that the world was covered uh, you know, entirely with water. And Herodotus, on the basis of Xenophanes' writings, concluded the same thing. Um, the point there kind of being that, so now you have people from Africa who speak the African languages, sometimes Coptic, sometimes Egyptian, sometimes Latin and Greek, people from Greece, people from the Aramaic regions, people from China, they all are coming to the same conclusions with different linguistic backgrounds, theological backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, all that. But in one unique area of the world and in one unique area of time, we're coming to one unique conclusion. I think that's an important thing to point out uh, when we have sort of, you know, these, these points that we would say like, oh, we'll take this versus the Catholic interpretation. The Catholic interpretation of, of Marian dogmas is another really good example. That was found uniquely in Latin churches, um, though it is prevalent in Greek churches. It's only prevalent in Greek churches post-influence from Latin churches. And, of course, the Great Schism of 1054 is one of the best evidences of that. The point to wrap it all up in a nutshell is just to say that much like with Catholic interpretation or with certain peculiarities of Coptic interpretation or even things that get bizarre and cultic like Mormon and Jehovah's Witnesses interpretation, one of the best things that indicates that they're a estranged interpretation or an incorrect interpretation, in my opinion, is their locality, both in region and in era. Um, okay, why does Josephus uh, communicate about our land, the Jewish land, and so on, in light of the quote-unquote arets or the land um, all throughout his Genesis narrative. And so when he when, when he reaches the flood narrative, when he's speaking about Herodotus there and so on, I find it interesting that Josephus says that there are survivors of the flood apart from Noah. And then he says, and these are accounted for in Barosus and those other, what you and I would call non-Christian texts, extra-biblical texts. Like why, why do you have Jewish literature in the Second Temple period? Book of Enoch as well speaks about one enclosed area. Um, why are Jewish literature like like these cognizant of a uh, of a local deluge? Uh, well, mainly from Greek influence, actually, is what my argument would be, at least. So I, I think the best example of this is to look, number one, at who the Jews who argued for a local flood were. 
Uh, you'll find Josephus referencing it. You also find, I think, Philo of Alexandria talks about a, a local deluge. Yeah. Um, yeah. They both have very heavy Platonic influence, and Plato actually going against Xenophanes and Herodotus and those coming before him believed that though there was a epic flood, that it was localized. Um, and, and fun fact, even though um, he separated this flood from the Atlantean flood, there are those who believe that those might be Plato's own confusion and, and he might be talking about the self-same story. I don't take a position about that, but not the, not the point, right? The point just being that there is a heavy Platonic influence, I think, in these highly Hellenized Jews, Josephus and Philo. And you can see this most clearly in the church fathers. Um, th I think the best quote for this in particular would be Theophilus. Uh, Theophilus is actually going out of his way to refute as early as 180 AD the Platonic notion that the flood was not actually global. He actually says, and this is a quote, uh, but Moses, our prophet and the servant of God, in giving an account of the genesis of the world, related in what manner the flood came upon the earth, telling us besides how the details of the flood came about, and relating no fable of Pyra nor of the uh, Decalon, I'm going to say these probably not correct, by the way, or uh, Clementius, nor, forsooth, the only plains, uh, that only the plains were submerged, and that those only who escaped to the mountains were saved. And neither does he make out that there was a second flood. On the contrary, he said that never again would there be a flood of water on the world, as neither indeed has there been, nor ever shall be. Uh, Theophilus here is actually presenting a polemic against Platonists, who say, yes, actually it's a position quite similar to what you're taking. Yes, there was a catastrophic flood, but it wasn't a global flood. It was something that impacted impacted all of uh, humanity. Now, to be brief, because I don't want to bog down in too many points so that you don't have an opportunity to respond, I would say also, in regards to the Nephilim in particular, um, the understanding as to how there could be surviving Nephilim after the flood, in my opinion, um, will a, a proper understanding of it will come from a proper understanding of what exactly the Nephilim are. Uh, it has been noted by many that the Nephilim could be angels mating with human beings, but I don't think that's true. It is interesting to note that though it's not ubiquitous, the majority opinion amongst the reformers, church fathers, and Second Temple Jews was that it was not true. All three of those groups actually take a majority, not all of them, but the majority take the position that the sons of God are the line of Seth. They go into the daughters of men, meaning the line of Cain, and the Nephilim continue through Noah as at least one of Noah's uh, um, excuse me, sons would be taking a wife of these daughters of men. And the precedent for this is, is uh, found clearly throughout Scripture. Number one, we see Jesus say plainly that the um, angels do not have sexual relations. Uh, but number two, and I think more importantly, um, we do see in the in the second uh, temple period, namely in the writing of the, uh, the book of Luke, that Adam was referred to as the son of God. And as we see Hezekiah and uh, Lemuel, who may be Solomon, but also Solomon himself, and all these other people, you know, um, Jesus, so on and so forth. If you're in the line of David, you're a son of David. If you're in the line of Jacob, you're a son of Jacob. If you're in the line of Abraham, you're a son of Abraham. So calling the line of Seth, which is clearly the line that the birthright follows from Adam to Seth. It's not going Adam to Cain, right? Um, I think that would show uh, give us precedent for Seth's line being referred to as the sons of God, because Adam is referred to as the son of God. So then when the sons of God go into the daughters of men, that would be a merging of the, of the two bloodlines, and that creates men of renown for some reason. I don't really know. There's obviously some genetic reason for it that a younger... Oh, well, men of the name in the Hebrew as well, yeah. Say again? Men of the name, like men of renown in the Hebrew literature yeah. is men of the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and so and yeah. so, I think that it's one of these things where um, what what you're seeing here is a blending of two uh, bloodlines, two cultures is probably the better way of put it that were uh, at first separated, probably along religious lines. Cain probably was not following Yehovah or Yahweh, whatever your your pronunciation is. Um, and uh, Seth's line probably was. And, and we see this kind of thing happen all the time, by the way, right? Esau is not the one given the birthright, even though he's just as much a son as Jacob. Rather, Jacob is given the birthright. Ishmael, same thing. Isaac is given the birthright, right? Um, and, and that would be sort of my response to why I think uh, these texts 
All right, it's not that we don't take them seriously, but why I think they're incorrect, right? Number one, I think they're very highly influenced by Platonists, and we see that communicated through the Church Fathers. And number two, I do think knowing what the consensus, even though it's not ubiquitous, understanding of what sons of God means at that time uh, gives us a different understanding of what Nephilim are in the first place, and that completely, I think, changes how they could survive the flood. Okay. So quick, because we have three minutes left, I'm going to ask you to uh, maybe spend like, <laughs> see if you can spend like five, ten seconds, because these are like shotgun questions I'm going to give you. Um, oh, do you agree that Genesis 1 is ambiguous as far as the extent of the geography is concerned? So in other words, when I say Genesis 1 starts in a global sense, that it is doing that. But then as you keep reading the chapter, it seems to become ambiguous with respect to the location of humans. And this is only about Genesis 1. Uh, I, I would personally not. Uh, I would say that what in my position is the Genesis 1 is talking uh, globally or creation-wide, and uh, Genesis 2 starts to get more specific, namely whittled down to an area of the world that we would now call Eden. Okay. So, in fact, yeah, that's basically how I'm, I was trying to get out of Genesis 1. Uh, so, Genesis 2, 3, 4, you would say, uh, obviously, localized geography. Uh, 2, 3, and 4. Yeah, it, definitely, because at that point in time, what I think you would have happen is um, it, it does appear that, biblically, uh, humanity comes from Mesopotamia originally, right, like after the Garden of Eden. Um, and so I think that that is where they're originally from and they branch out wherever they branch out from that particular okay. region. So Genesis six then, so here's, here's the starting point really, because notice Genesis eight, four has Noah, Noah's Ark landing. And in the ancient Near, Near Eastern accounts, it's Uratu, Judy, obviously the translation Ararat, but it's in that, what's known as Uratu proper. Yeah, like modern so, day Armenia. Right, exactly. It's all in that same region. So Genesis 6, and my, this is my final question with, in the last one minute 30. So Genesis 6.14 plagued scholars until Akkadian literature was unearthed and they were able to uh, do some etymological homework with respect to the terms that otherwise were very difficult to translate. So Genesis 6.14 says, make yourself an ark. This is a this is a typical translation. Make yourself an ark out of cedar, which the Hebrew there is gopher, constructing compartments, and that, that's the other unknown word. So compartments in it and covered inside and out with tar. But now because they're able to um, decipher the three words that are unknown. So, so the one for cedar, compartments, and tar, they are Akkadian loan words with respect to the practice of the humans at the time. So the Marsh Arabs today, uh, they build up uh, houses out of reeds. So you can actually translate, we can retranslate that, that as saying, make for yourself a vessel of stalks from a reed hut. With reeds, you will make the vessel and tar it inside and out with bitumen. And then just to clarify, and Marlon, if you can give CJ another 20 seconds out of this. All right. A second temple text, Wisdom of Solomon reads, uh, because of him, the earth was flooded. Wisdom again came to the rescue. Wisdom took a man who did what was right and steered him straight on a vessel made of cheap wood. This is the only reason in the end why humans can entrust their lives to cheap pieces of wood and can reach land safely by riding the breaking stuff on a ship that is no more than a raft. And so near the beginning at the time when, when proud giants, that's the Nephilim language, were being destroyed, the hope of the world escaped on just such a raft. So my question to you is, again, notice you have Second Temple text speaking of the Ark as nothing but this little cheap piece of wood, like a raft-like structure. You have ancient areas of scholarship with loan words speaking about Noah's vessel as nothing but a reed hut. And you've just told me that you agree that basically Genesis 2 to 6 is a localized geography all happening in that same region anyway. And, it, and the flood narrative ends with the same region. So why does the passage have all these parameters to it? Because a global flood just seems to be so unnecessary in, the, in light of that, these details. Yeah. 
Uh, well, so there's a, a couple things, and I'll try to be bullet pointed to make it quick. Um, so the first thing I would say that I think other texts in Scripture, um, it is like I would say, I, I think they exhaust the language to say that there is a global flood. So in other words, all these positions could be true if it weren't for uh, X, Y, and Z passages, which seem to indicate clearly that there is a global flood. Uh, the second thing I would say is localization in, in regards to a specific region does need to be first off interpreted correctly and second off um, understood to mean only in regards to a specific line. Um, so, for example, in regards to that second point, Cain is said to go east of Eden towards Nod. Uh, Eden is commonly believed by people to be in the Persian Gulf region, and I actually don't necessarily disagree with that, actually, so we'll just go ahead and assume that that's the case. Uh, so east of that region, then, would be something like Iran, um, potentially farther east than that, depending on how far he actually decides to go, right? Uh, if we have a flood that's supposed to be taking out all of humanity, and this flood is only taking out the region we now call Mesopotamia, as well as what we would now call the Persian Gulf, which has remained underwater ever since, um, then there's a whole civilization over on that side that's just fine, right? Nothing's actually happening to them because they're east of Eden, and this is actually only going through Eden and up to the north. Uh, the other thing I would point out is it doesn't actually go all the way up through all of Mesopotamia. It ends right about where we would call like the center point. Um, but it doesn't go all the way up to Ararat, uh, and which in fact is past the end points of the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Mount Ararat, which is a misnomer because it's not actually the mountain that Noah was on, but it's a, it's a part of the mountain range that is in the mountains of Ararat. If one looks at a map on it, actually, so there you have Turkey, right? There's this little divot. So Turkey kind of goes like this, and there's this little itty-bitty divot that goes into Armenia. And it's just like this little tiny region of Turkish geography. That's where Mount Ararat actually is. Um, now, again, the Mount Ararat isn't actually the translation. It's mountains of Ararat. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that we call it that. But what that shows you is that the, the Uratu Mountains were in that region that's actually farther north than the Persian Gulf flood is said to have occurred and would once again provide for us a uh, civilization that is seemingly not impacted by it. Um, and the other thing I would also point out as well, which I think is very important for us to note, is we're not talking about a sailboat, right? We're talking about an ark. Um, why is that a thing that's important to reference? Well, because if Noah himself lived in the Persian Gulf region, the boat isn't going to be leaving and going somewhere else. The fact that it even went all the way up north, which is almost a thousand miles, is actually quite impressive because it's just an ark, right? It's not actually moving, sailing, anything along those lines. Um, so we shouldn't expect him to end up right, like in Mexico, for example, um, or, or anywhere else in the world, because he's not actually using a vessel that's supposed to do anything other than simply float. And I, I, I could say more, but I don't want to take too much time because I know we're out of time. So I'll just kind of end it there. All right, guys. Good stuff. Good stuff. Great cross examination. I think everyone has enjoyed it. The live chat is enjoying it. So that's how we go move into closing remarks. Uh, you got five minute closings. Uh, starting with CJ. Uh, you're up for your five minute closing. Absolutely. I appreciate you. And I want to again say I do uh, appreciate very greatly uh, Marlon for hosting this debate. Um, this is my first time on the Gospel Truth, and hopefully it's not my last. I, I really like the platform and I really like the channel. I obviously want to recommend people you subscribe to this channel because it does provide for us a very awesome platform for um, not just in-house, but also out-of-house debates as well with a theological bent. I also thank you to Rob for having this discussion with me. Uh, we have actually been able to. It's interesting because our first communication um, was emotional, to say the least. It was passionate. We'll go. We'll say that much. Uh, but since then, it has managed to be a, a pretty uh, solid and respectful, um, you know, uh, relationship, if you will. I guess that would be the word. And so I appreciate Rob for having this discussion with me as well uh, in brotherly love, as First Peter three fifteen does let us or does tell us to do. Uh, and of course, appreciations to the audience for watching. To get to the points, I think what in my view, and of course, I'm debating for one side, so perhaps I am biased in this situation. But in my view, what we've seen here today is a couple clear indications that the Bible does indeed indicate a global flood. To reiterate what I think those are, number one, uh, I think that we have a level of absurdity in God. Um, commanding certain things to occur and promising certain things 
if indeed this is only a local flood. I mentioned the uh, Rainbow Covenant when we have numerous absolutely devastating floods pretty much cyclically all throughout the world. Um, I uh, pointed to taking two by two every animal and building this big boat when in reality there's going to be perfectly stable populations of every single species you're going to actually have on this boat mere miles away from you. If you have a global flood hypothesis, there is no species that we know of that is actually endemic to the Persian Gulf region. So literally nothing would go extinct. Um, of course, there's the absurdity of having Moses or not Moses, excuse me, Noah do all this work when he could, he could just move. He could literally just move. And then there, there's of course the exhaustive language, um, which in my opinion is, is, quite unpassable when you consider the question, how could God have possibly communicated a global flood if he didn't in Genesis? Now, it's interesting. I was asked, how could God have communicated a local flood if he wanted to, specifically a local flood that did actually take out all, if not most, of humanity? And I do think that's a good question, but I do think that there is a simple answer, something along the lines of, and God flooded the whole um, region, and God flooded the people of Noah's day, and God flooded the nation of such and such. Maybe he could say the nation of Nod. God flooded this region. God flooded this city, so on and so forth. But instead, God chooses to communicate that he flooded the earth, that all flesh was destroyed, that even the animals were destroyed, even the fowls and the creeping thing were destroyed. Language that certainly takes you away from locality into global, uh, globality, if you will. Right? I don't think globality is a word, but we're going to go ahead and make it a word for this debate. Um, I also think that we saw what, what, in my opinion, is something that does not end up being consistent in regards to this is a polemic against a rainbow deity. Um, you know, we see the deities like Kus are not actually presented to the Hebrew people until after the exile, and that people who suggest that this is actually a polemic against deities like Kus are actually relying on the current scholarly consensus that Moses did not actually write all, if any, of the Torah. And, and me and, of course, um, Rob being respecters of the scripture would disagree with them on that. Well, if Michael Heiser, John Walton, and others are going to make as a foundation point for their argument that this is written in a post-exilic period, responding to Babylonian people and other such Mesopotamian cultures in the region where they're exiled. Uh, if we don't agree with that, then why, we don't agree with the very foundation we have to assume there is any reason for this to be a polemic directed at these specific deities. Rather, what we do have is a somebody who is writing thousands, if not hundreds in some instances, but in, in at least one instance, a thousand years before these deities are said to actually be around. And I think that's a very important note for us to examine here. We also see that even though it's not ubiquitous, it is nearly ubiquitous amongst the church fathers, the early rabbis, the reformers, even the um, uh, Christian writers in between the church fathers and the reformers. We have a nearly ubiquitous understanding, though not ubiquitous, a nearly ubiquitous understanding of this communicating a global flood. And we see those who are not understanding this in the same way other people tend to, do tend to have some kind of an influence that comes from a localized region. For example, Josephus and Philo are very highly influenced by Platonists in Greece. Modern day Westerners are very much influenced by the modern academic paradigm and so on and so forth. Now, with all that being said, the book of Proverbs chapter 27 um, does, and I'm paraphrasing, but it does let us uh, tell us to not brag about ourselves, but to let our bragging come from without. And also tells us that iron is to sharpen iron. So if I did great, you guys let me know that I did great. And if I did terrible, please do let me know that I did terrible as well. All in the name of God and for his glory. Shalom and God bless. I pass this on to Rob. All right. Thank you, CJ. All right, Rob, you're up for your five minute closing. And let me know when you're ready. I'll start your time. I think you're muted, Rob. All right. Thanks, CJ. Right. Thanks for that uh, very loving interaction uh it's it's probably the uh the most relaxing debate i've had on marlon's channel to be honest um yeah and uh i apologize to everyone out there i i thought you were, you must have thought this was going to be like bloodbaths but no it I, I i do agree this this debate has been we were just scratching the surface but um 
that's why I have the notes I, I have. And um, I recommend anyone, if you want to look into this more, go onto my channel and it's like a whole two hour lecture I give. But a, a few closing remarks in regards to, again, my model and notice in this sense, the admission that's being made. Um, Cause I'll, I'll, I'll work with CJ's closing from the end back. So notice at the end, he introduces platonic sort of influence. Now, I will personally say yes and no to that. Um, but let's just go along with one particular example from the New Testament that does, in hindsight sort of Philo and Josephus and, and these writers, Peter, in Second Peter 2 and 3. So in Second Peter 2, verse 4, you have this language about the angels sinning, throw, you know, God threw them down in Tartarus. Now notice Tartarus, ooh, that's Greco-Roman language, right? Which, but don't forget the Greco-Roman Hellenistic context of Tartarus is going back to that ancient Babylonian tradition of the watchers and all that stuff. But in verse 5, it says, and if he did not spare the ancient world, that's very curious language, ancient world, because don't forget Genesis 1 to 11 is that ancient proto-history stuff, right? But protected Noah, a righteous preacher, along with seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of ungodly people. Notice it's not just saying, it's not saying world. It's defining the flood as happening on ungodly people. Now, where are they localized? That's the question. Peter then, in, in literally in the next verse, says, and if you condemn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, oh, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, that's not global. That's a localizing judgment. Same thing in chapter 3. When he sent the flood, so in chapter 3, verse 6, uh, by which the world at that time was deluged with water and destroyed. In the Greek, literally world at that time, you, you could translate it as humanity at that time because the, the qualifier with respect to cosmos is tote. So with Greek linguistics and grammar alone, Peter doesn't have the the, the world like 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 John three sixteen sort of world right cosmos he doesn't have that in mind you have to this is again you have to honor the the grammar and the context of the languages so the last two minutes um, bringing that in light you know in, in that in context all I can say is I'm honoring the ancient areas in context and at the same time acknowledging the latest in anthropological research scientifically and also earth science and all that stuff. So Genesis 1 is just a chronology of natural history in the creation process. It doesn't say where humans are, but we know humans come from Africa migrating into the Persian Gulf. Genesis 2 has all the geographical descriptions of the Persian Gulf, the four rivers, the, the stones that are there and so on. And so therefore, if Noah is localized in that region, and sure enough, he does a lot of things within that region. And sure enough, the Genesis 6 narrative starts with the Watcher myth, the Adapa myth, which is again in that region. And if they, and if, if verse 4 in the text says that the Nephilim survived the flood, it can't be global because the Nephilim then migrate into Canaan. And that's why you have Abraham still in Ur having to then be given the promise that, he, that his, his descendants will, will overtake Canaan. So Noah in the same region, because of the of the Indian Ocean waters f flooding into the Persian Gulf, naturally this reed arc boat thing is then migrating up north, and it's not the it's not Ararat, because don't forget that's a massive region. In the text, it's Uratu. In fact, and in tradition, in Josephus and the Church Fathers, Ephraim the Syrian mentions this. It's specifically Mount Judy which is a lot lower. So you have, you have Ararat as this massive region, but then Uratu becomes a little bit more localized in Mount Judy. And then in the last five seconds, basically compare also the other Old Testament creation accounts like Psalm 104, Job 38, as showcasing that they had in mind the creation account, which means Genesis 1, 2 will never happen again. And so the nose flood has to be local in that sense to, in order to not cause a contradiction in scripture. All right. Good stuff, guys. Great job. Great job. All right. We're going to jump into this Q&A. Uh, we got a bunch of questions out there. So 
We are going to start with Rob. You got a lot of questions. They're coming after you, Rob. So for the uh, first time, I'm getting questions directed to me now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got one. Thank you so much for the question, Rob. The Genesis flood lasts over one year. Can you think of any local flood that lasts three months? Ah, yes. So that 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 flooding. You're talking seven hundred thousand square kilometers worth of water. And, and hey, before you answer that, Rob, sorry, I mean, yeah. y'all. Hey, both of you guys get one minute each to respond to the question. Both of y'all some talkers, man. Both of y'all got that radio oh, yeah, okay. monologue tone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hey, we're going to get one minute each, man. That's that standard for all, all debaters, man. Go ahead, Rob. Answer the question. One minute, man. Okay. <laughs> so, it, according to the model I presented, when you saw that 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 flooding in that Persian Gulf, that's 700,000 square kilometers, which is a lot of water, first and foremost. And here's a little tongue-in-cheek, more like a physics comment. You can actually, if you take it literally, like the whole globe being flooded, and you take the 150 days, you know, the whole year, like 150 days, 150 days for the waters to go up and then go down. You can actually calculate the speed at which the water will rise and and go down if you take a global flood view. And guess what? Sand particles and tectonic uplift and so on will not happen. It won't even move sand particles. It's too slow. Which means whatever the Earth looked like pre-flood will look exactly the same post-flood if you take that 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 rate that speed at which the water's you know rising and, and falling literally uh with with that time frame all right cj uh yeah so i i would just say that i think um i do certainly think it's possible for a flood to last longer than a year my biggest problem i guess when it comes to the persian gulf model is that uh technically the persian gulf flood never ended um the Persian Gulf to this day is actually flooded and we never got that region back. So in a way, if God was talking about flooding the Persian Gulf, um, when he says the waters dissipated, it doesn't seem that he was being entirely um, forward with the information, uh, considering, like I said, the Persian Gulf is to this day covered in water. But th that's uh, you know a little tongue in cheek to an extent. But I, I would just say that I think that... Um, the problem does kind of go in reverse in regards to this particular flood. All right. And this question is for you, Jay. If the flood is global, how did the Neph Neph Nephilim survive it? Numbers 13, chapter 33, uh, chapter 13, verse 33. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that the Nephilim, so if you take the understanding that the Nephilim are half angel, half human hybrids, then this can become incredibly problematic. Uh, but if you take the position that was the consensus, though not ubiquitous position, uh, of both the ancient Jews and the ancient Christians, uh, namely that this was the mixing of the lines of Seth and the lines of Cain, um, then the only, the only thing you actually need in order for the Nephilim to survive is at least one of the children of um, Noah taking a wife of the lineage of Cain. Uh, my personal guess would be probably Ham, considering the curse of Canaan and so on with that, as well as where we end up finding the Nephilim. Uh, and that was the, the common understanding of the rabbis as well. Uh, if that is the case, then there's no reason to assume that the Nephilim survived, quote unquote, as much as it is just sort of something that happens, genealogically speaking, whenever these two lineages mix. All right, Rob. My answer is Numbers 30 and 33 is, is key here in light of Genesis 6-4. Genesis 6-4 is a parenthetical remark, which guess what? There's your editorial thing coming into play, right? So this is where highs will come and or people like him will say, look, you have an editor reminding future readers who are reading that in the moment. So in this case, maybe the Babylonian exile that, oh yeah, you know the, you know the, the Adapa myths and the Babylonian thing and you know the whole watcher myth and the sons of god nephilim so the apkalu the apkalu the the the, the, the post delivian apkalu that survive yeah they were also after the flood so then when you keep reading through the torah where do we see moments of these apkalu popping into existence but were always there but it's not that they pop into existence ex nihilo 
Now, if you take the purely human view, which is actually uh, very alien to the text, but even if you go along with that, the point is the text is saying that these people survive and they've, they've escaped somewhere. Specifically, and this is why number 1333 is important, I'll end it with this. There's an extra yod in that verse with respect to Nephilim. So they have a generic Nephilim, the word Nephilim, and then there's a the, it, it, the word occurs again in the same verse, but with an extra yod. And grammatically, that extra yod is to say, this Nephilim that the spies are seeing is the Nephilim of Genesis 6, meaning it's not like some later Nephilim. It is the Nephilim of Genesis 6 that are that are now in this region. And that's the grammatical point that the question is asking about. All right. And here's a question for you, Rob. It says, Rob, recently you stated Noah couldn't move to a different area because there was too many animals. But the Bible states that there was a specified number. So witness made it possible. Okay. Um, first and foremost, I, I don't think I said that, that it was too many animals. Um, but I, I will clarify uh, basically my belief, and that is um, the animals that the ancient, so the Second Temple Jews and just anyone in that, in that region knew about was basically farm animals. Noah was a farmer. He, he builds a vineyard and so on, right? And notice the raven and the dove, those are also species that you see in Job's list as well, because he lists the, the species as well. So you don't see dinosaurs and all that. Now, as far as migration goes, if he's a farmer, and guess what? You have to deal with human husband, husbandry and how people at the time used to think and behave. For example, when I mentioned the reed hut thing, so make yourself and the arc out of reeds, what they would do is they would take what they already have, dismantle it and make it into something new. If they were to move, they're going into regions that are completely alien and foreign to them. That's the first point. And secondly, if the Persian Gulf is indeed the region for the flood, that entire region is surrounded with mountainous mountains as peaks. Why do you think ancient Near Eastern language, uh, texts always speak about the mountains of the gods in this region. Why do you think the Babylonian map, the circle of the Babylonian map has mountains on its edge? Because again, they're perceiving this region as like an enclosed region of where, where, where mountains are in the horizon. So there's no, it, it's illogical then to make a move to climb over mountains and have cows with you climbing over mountains. It's logistically not possible. All right, CJ, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would simply say that I, I think that it certainly is true to say that it's logistically not possible to just walk out with all these animals. The problem, though, is there's no necessity to take any of the animals. Uh, in my personal view, if you have a localized flood, um, the animal species are going to be perfectly fine. I mean, unless you have a particular attachment to these animals, meaning that they're your animals, but that doesn't seem to be what the text is communicating. Um, and, and so really, if you're talking about like, well, we need to take two by two of each of these kinds to preserve the species and replenish the earth. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if we have perfectly viable populations outside of the flood area. And again, there's no endemic species to this region. So there's not a single species that could have been lost. Um, if, if Noah didn't take any of them, right. A couple animals would die, uh, but nothing would be like extinct or wiped off the face of the planet. Um, so while I would agree with Rob that it doesn't make any sense at all to move with all these animals, uh, the thing I would disagree on is it doesn't make any sense to have any of the animals just move. All right. And here's a question for both of you. If the flood was local, how do you account for ancient flood stories from around the world like Native Americans and Chinese people? Uh, CJ, you can tackle this one first since Rob answered first last time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would just say uh, I, I think that's a very good point. And I think that there is a lot actually of uh, other cultures, legends that uh, harken back to this period. Because, of course, this period, you know, if there was any sort of a global flood, then all humans came from the bottleneck civilization that came from it, or the bottleneck fa family in this case, right? Um that, of course, they would all have some recollection, culturally speaking, of this event. 
And so in my opinion, that is that not only is the questioner hitting on a, a very solid detail, um, but also I, I think you have to take into account now that you have this solid detail, why would it, you know, why would all these people have precisely what you would expect if you have a global flood, if not uh, for a global flood? And Occam's razor, in my opinion, would demand that you say, well, because there is a global flood. They all suggest that one had happened because one had happened. Um, assuming that they all came to the same conclusion that there was a global flood, but it's not related to the bottleneck that they all share with each other, in my opinion, is just too complicated of a theory. All right, Rob? Yeah. That, that is actually, and I'm going to just say this bluntly, that is actually uh, a myth, this thing known as there's many cultures that have a, a flood narrative. If you... Like you, like for example, in the Chinese religion, there is this thing known as a, a flood. Like they do have flood uh, in their literature, in their religious literature, but it's it's completely uh, not at all associated with universal language that you see more so in the ancient areas. In other words, if you're talking about what other texts apart from Genesis speak about a flood in this sort of way, always in the in the Middle East in the Mesopotamian context. Um, now, if you do have other cultures, I'm just saying for argument's sake, if you do have other cultures in the Far East and the Far West speaking about this catastrophe that where you have one man in a boat and all that, notice that that language, if, if, if humans are, are already around the world and if the flood is already global, therefore the, the humans around the world are dying and they can't preserve the story. So why would there be flood legends around the world if everyone's dead anyway? And even if they were so, to somehow survive, say say some China, China man was to survive, how does he know that there's this guy named Noah in the Middle East surviving this thing? And then he you know he writes it down in his own Chinese way and like that it just doesn't fit the anthropological studies in regards to legend in human myth. Um, so the flood in this case fits very comfortably in a local sense because guess what? It's coming from that local region in, in the Persian Gulf. All right. And here's another question. Rob, you can answer this one first now. Uh, why do you think the discussion or debate over whether the flood was global or local um, were local and important one for us Christians? Example, give it can it affect the understanding of key scriptures, or key doctrine? Wait, can you can you repeat the question again? It says, why do you think the discussion over whether the flood was global or local is an important one for us Christians? Can it affect the understanding of key doctrine? Oh, definitely not. That's the f first and foremost. That's I think CJ and I would thoroughly agree on this, and that is. Um, it, it is an interpretive issue on, on this thing we call the flood. Now, I, to be honest, that that's probably a question I'd like even CJ to to bounce back with me and, and, and if he can tell me if it's crucial for him. But but for me personally, not. However, uh, if there was a key theological teaching I can get out of this, I would I I I thoroughly love the way the New Testament authors use this thing called Pesha, which is interpretation with respect to the flood and that entire tradition, so Babylonian tradition, Second Temple tradition on, onwards, to then make this powerful image about Jesus. So Second Peter 3, he brings up the flood narrative. And then you have this language of Jesus going to the spirits in prison. You know, and it's just like, ooh, what is he getting at there? Oh, it's those sons of God in Genesis 6 being judged. They were put in Tartarus. And then notice that it, at the end of the day, it all comes down to Jesus. And then the flood, regardless whether it's global or local, becomes a type for baptism. And then baptism is basically spiritual warfare. That if you, in other words, I, I don't believe in baptismal regeneration. Don't get me wrong. But basically, very simply, if you baptize, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're bat being baptized in his death, burial, and resurrection, which means you're slapping Satan in the face. Every time a person's baptized, he's lost one person away and in other words one person has entered the kingdom of god and so that's how that's how i would approach 
the flood story if I were to theologize it in a Christian way. Uh, but I wouldn't really uh, disfellowship over the size of the flood or whatever. Um, yeah. All right. CJ? Yeah, so I would say um, it's a twofold answer. Um, the first part, I would say, it's, I definitely do not think it is a salvific issue. I don't think it's an issue that we should be splitting churches over or having, you know, you're a heretic fights over or anything like that. Um, I do think it can be a problematic thing, though, and that's why I think it's important. And so, and let me specify what I mean by that, because it's obviously there's a razor's, razor's edge there in, you know, this is an issue we all need to be hurling at each other versus this is an issue that's important, but not that level of important. Um, so, like, so, for example, when we come to questions like Joshua, and I'll, I'll tie this up in a bow so you guys will know where, where I'm getting at it. And people will say, well, Joshua's being hyperbolic, or Joshua is to destroy the Nephilim, or Joshua is this, that, and the other thing, whatever it is. The point being, they're trying desperately to escape what Joshua says, which is uh, that Kohan Nishama, namely everything that breathes, was put to the sword. Everything was destroyed. Everything was annihilated, right? Why do they have this kind of an understanding? Because it seems cruel. It seems rough. It seems brutal. It seems like it's something that God wouldn't do. It seems like it may be contradictory to what we understand, historically speaking, in our modern paradigm. And for all of these different reasons, people want to explain away these events. You have the exact same thing take place in the flood. To, to get to the core of the point, the nucleus, the nougat, of what I'm trying to say. Um, when you have this view that even if you don't intend it to be the case, does effectively downplay not only God's ability to communicate literally, but also God's judgment on wicked man, then that starts to bleed in, I think, to the rest of your theology. The fact of the matter is God did not destroy all of humanity in the flood or all of the Canaanites in the conquests or all of these other different instances to get rid of a specific group or to destroy the Nephilim or you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it happens to be. God does these things because he is a righteous, holy, very, um, uh, what would the word be there, just deity who does not take kindly to the wickedness of man. And when the thoughts of man's heart is evil continually, he judges it, and he judges it ultimately and with severity. Uh, I think that when we start localizing the flood, much like with other situations, we start to create a God that is no longer the righteous judge that he claims to be, which unfortunately that does kind of put an image in people's head of the executioner God. But frankly, he is the executioner God. He is the judge. He's the attorney. He's the executioner. He's the prosecutor. He's the entire court system. And in this particular instance, if you're found guilty, he is quite serious with the way that he treats sin. And the other problem, to be very brief, is I do think it does create a problem with understanding Scripture. You can easily get into the whole, well, if this isn't literal, then the Tower of Babel might not be literal. Then, of course, you have the, the genealogies might not be literal, and the ages might not be literal, and Abraham might not be literal, and is Moses literal? And if Moses isn't literal, then Jesus is the prophet, like unto whom exactly? And you can get into, you can certainly get into some issues. Um but that, that would be how I wrap it up. I actually, to add one more thing, I would simply say my last thing that I, I find can be problematic. Um, I haven't personally heard this from Rob tonight, but it's something that Hugh Ross says a lot. And I, I think Hugh Ross is a Christian, but I take a very big issue with this aspect of his theology. The idea of, of the book of nature, as people will say, right? Um, I'm not saying that nature isn't something that we can get very very wise um, knowledge from very good gleams on how this world works. But the idea that there's a book of nature, I think can be incredibly deceiving, especially considering the fact that we cannot, nor will we ever have access to all of scripture. Whereas I have 56 versions or all, all of the book of uh, nature rather, whereas I have 56 versions of scripture on this phone. Um, I can look at it in every different way. And so I will be able to have a complete understanding of scripture, not of the way nature works. And I think that can be a problem as well. All right, guys, we have another question here. Super chat. Thank you, Grant, for the super chat. Appreciate you. Uh, what do you think of the hydroplate th theory? Hydroplate theory. Uh, CJ, you want to go first on this one? Yeah, sure. I would just say um, I, I do agree with it. 
I think that it's probably accurate. I think it explains a lot of uh, factors as to how our world works. I'm also not really huge into science, though. And even the areas of science that I re am really into, they tend to be related to other things. Um, namely, I like to study stuff like paleontology and zoology because I'm really interested in animals and I'm really interested in dinosaurs, mammoths, quote unquote, cavemen and all that other kind of stuff. But obviously none of that has to do with tectonic plates and how all that works. So from a purely layman's perspective, I like it. I think it's good. Um, it seems to be to, to me to be sound. And that's kind of where I would leave it and leave it to wiser folks than I to defend. All right, uh, Robert, what do you think? Yeah, uh, completely bogus. <laughs> if the hydroplate theory actually happened, I mean, it, it, you know, Walter Brown's hypothesis, if, it, if that actually happened, Earth would be hotter than the sun. And so, I mean, I, like, for example, because I have his book, and he goes into, because uh, I've just opened it, he goes into, like, you know, the water jets, so that, you know, the faults. And he believed, by the way, he believes in the type of Pangaea. And then you have this, this breaking apart of Pangaea to then make the continents. But hang on, where did the material go, right? So then he's like, look, that, that became the comets, the asteroids, the meteoroids, and what astrophysicists call uh, trans-Neptunian objects, the TNOs. And so, but we, but we know the mass, like when we actually do measurements, surveys, parallax, uh, when we send satellites out and we look at spectral analysis of these Kuiper belt objects and all that, we, we know the mass, we know the velocity, we know the energy input. If they were to either crash on Earth or if, if, you, were want, if, you, if you wanted to try and eject out, uh, which, by the way, it's part of the... Uh, old Earth creationist model anyway for the Earth, like uh, what, what's called the late heavy Bobon period, which is very early in Earth's history. You do have Earth material going out. So that being said, when you do all the calculation and then you compare, say, the, the sun's energy flux, which is something like like 10 to the 7 watts per square, you know, 10 to the 7 watts per square meter, something like that, the amount of energy required for then the Earth to then shoot out from its core out is like 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 somewhere somewhere in that that region watts per square meter and so therefore um where's that energy coming from it's like magic energy from internally the earth's core just going like like you know like boom like i need a release if that happened <laughs> the earth wouldn't exist uh, a, a, a reed, a reed boat, would definitely be obliterated. So, uh, yeah. All right. And this will be the final question for tonight, Robert Rowe. If the local flood, according to modern geology, was something that took place about 2000 BC, after 2000 BC, through the region, why did the Ark need to be 65 feet tall for a 20-foot flood? Okay, first and foremost, I'm not saying it's 2000 BC. Uh, that's a bit too recent. Um, I am saying that if I was to date Adam and Eve, they would go 70,000 years ago, Persian Gulf region. Noah would be anywhere anywhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago. So the flood and that paper, the 2015 paper I, I shared, he estimates that so it is a fact. There is this deluge in the Persian Gulf. Now, as far as the Arabah, he, the oldest you can go is about 12,000 BC, and the youngest you can go is about 8,500 BC in that, in that region, in that mark. That fits very comfortably with the origin of language, the origin of cultures moving out in the, in the Euro-Asian context. Um, so therefore... Uh, the other part of the question about the arc's height. So that being said, now this goes back to that this, our earlier discussion I had with respect to um, you know the polemical context of the passage. So Genesis five. Now the ages are not literal; they are base sixty numbers, and it has a direct correlation with this thing called the Sumerian king list. So if you go with 
the figures then from Genesis 1 to 11 as being this thing we call base 60 and not base 10, that means you can't then take not only the arc's dimensions, but also the the the, the, the amount of time that will transpire, so things like 120 years. Guess what? That's in a base 60 sense, that's 2 times 60. So that means you can't read that as a literal 120 figure. So then the arc dimensions follow that same trajectory. And so therefore, um, if you were... Now notice, that means you can't translate the cubits there as being 22 feet. But the Hebrew does still say it's drenching up the mountains by 15 cubits, if you were to stay with the cubit reading. So therefore, notice, if you have to honor the ancient Near Eastern text, it, it completely fits my um, perspective on this uh, with respect to honoring the text for what it is. And therefore, any global flooding conclusion can't be made from that. Um, and you have, to, you have to deal with the fact that the text clearly says a reed, a reed-like boat, and you can't have 300 cubits length and like which is 450 cub feet or something long worth of reeds and so on. That it, it that's just nonsensical. So, um, all right, yeah. CJ. Yeah. So I would say that um, there's a couple things I think. So. The first thing I would say is that I think the question points out something very solid. Um, I, I, you know, we have these theories of like, uh, uh, you know, sexagesimal um, uh, mathematical systems and stuff like that to create different kinds of numbers. But the thing is, they always run into pretty massive errors. Uh, for example, if you take a symbolic understanding of the patriarch's ages, then um, Enoch is something like five and a half years old when he has his first child. Uh, which is obviously a complete absurdity. Um, th and the reason I point that out is just to say that, you know, these are these are theories which I think not only do they do nothing but actually muddle the water. In other words, they don't provide you any answers. They just create questions and make Genesis a text that's impossible to understand. Um, but on top of that, they don't actually work. Um, and, in f and not only do they not actually work, but it's important to understand that the Hebrews didn't actually believe that they worked. Uh, for example, the Cedar Olam, uh, which is a text written sometime between the year 50 and 150 AD. It's a text written by Hebrews for Hebrews in the Hebrew language. Uh, they have a firm understanding of rabbinical tradition, of oral law, of what we could call now a proto-Kabbalah, because Kabbalah didn't quite exist yet. Um, and they never have any such notion of, of sexagesimal math mathematical systems, or using 12 and 40s in symbolic ways, or of symbolic ages for the patriarchs. And those who do have symbolic ages for the patriarchs never come to the same conclusions that modern scholars do. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting ones to note is Rashi, who says that the Earth is about 40,000 years old. That's uh, significantly different than, obviously, 4.6 billion, and different from 17,000 as well, right? There's a massive discrepancy there. Um, however, the point, just to, to, to kind of make right, the Hebrews who have an understanding of their own cultural mathematical system, who know their own language, who understand their own uh, proto-gematria um, and proto-Kabbalah, which is where you end up getting these symbolic numbers, who understand their proto-oral law, which is where you're going to end up getting the Talmud and things like that. They actually have surviving texts that we have today, such as the Cedar Olam, the Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, so on and so forth, that communicate to us quite clearly that it was at least consensus, though not ubiquitous, that these ages were understood literally. Um, and I think that, again, I would also stress on top of that, that there is no real way to understand the text if they're not literal. People can say, well, we have this theory, that theory, and the other theory, but they're all theories for somebody to understand a culture that has no surviving remnants to this day, as, of course, no cultures back from that time do. Now, before anybody says, oh, but the Hebrews exist, yeah, they do, but they're not doing the same things that they were back then. They're not following biblical Israelite religion. They're not using the same alphabetical system. They're not operating in the same cultural context, so on and so forth, right? So it's all guesswork. And I think this understanding of symbolic ages does create uh, uh, a massive question mark over Genesis. And I'll just go ahead and end there. All right, good stuff, guys. Appreciate you guys for doing You guys did a great job, man. Appreciate you both, man. I send out gifts, CJ. Uh, your first time on the God's Truth, man. I'll be sending you a gift just to thank you uh, for me to you. And Robert, appreciate you, buddy. 
You take care, man. No worries, brother. Any Thank final you. any final words uh, before I shut this thing down? God bless you and you as well, CJ. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed the debate, but again, you're scratching the tip of the iceberg, and I just recommend everyone to have a, you know, First Peter three fifteen in mind about having a graciousness about topics like this because the gospel is the most like you know the the, the name of this channel the gospel truth the gospel is first and foremost the most important truth that first needs to be known before we get to any of these other topics so yes yeah. cj yeah absolutely and i would uh, i would certainly agree with that and i would say um you know uh this has been a, a very fun thing i also i appreciate you um Marlon, um, not only for hosting, but also for, you know, saying you're going to provide a gift. I wasn't expecting a gift. That's kind of cool. Um, but nonetheless, I, I appreciate you guys tremendously. Um, again, I want to reference uh, Proverbs chapter 27, uh, which talks about not boasting, but letting your boasting come from without you and also ar uh, iron sharpening iron, meaning that whoever you think did a good job, you should say it. We shouldn't say it. And whoever you think did a bad job, if anyone did a bad job, Go ahead and say something. Iron sharpens iron and creates a sharper sword. Um, so thank you guys very much. I appreciate you guys. Hopefully we'll be, you know, having conversations like this in the future. And God bless. All right, guys. You, take, you guys take care. God bless you guys. And thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, another great debate, man. Excellent topic. Good insight, good detail, and I appreciate both of these guys for doing that, coming on the show and, and laying it out for everyone to hear it, man. Uh, once again, I reiterate what Rob and CJ said, you know, uh, topics like these that some people can get really get their feathers ruffled, ruffled and they get hostile. You know, the best way to engage subject matter that you do not like or that you simply disagree with is to do it in a way that's that's, that's gracious, right? That's uh, That has salt on it, you know? And it's important that we do that, that we uh, do things in a manner that's going to actually ha allow the person that you disagree with to actually hear what you're saying, right? So that's, that's how we want to engage these these conversations, these areas of disagreement in a manner that I that we just saw CJ and Robert do. Obviously, this is a passionate topic. Uh, it's a passionate uh, area of discussion, but you can, you are able to do it in a manner that's God glorifying, and that's what we want to do. I also want to give a shout out to uh, uh, TM1 K E T M one K uh I guess Mike T M Mike I guess I can say maybe I don't know if he's messing up his name to tell a little different there uh, but I thank you for the super chat appreciate you man and thank you for everyone who is supporting the ministry in any way subscribe like whatever you're doing follow and financially I do appreciate everyone for supporting the ministry uh, that said make sure you are on the lookout for all the shows that are coming up here in the future don't you leave this channel without subscribing because it's important that you do um, I have a couple shows left coming up and then you won't see me again until September all right once again i'm taking a, a paternity sabbatical and i'll be spending time with my family and my newborn child that's coming here in the next couple weeks so make sure that you pray for my wife pray for my family uh so that and pray for my baby obviously uh so that he'll come out healthy and strong right um and that said i thank everyone for joining me uh may god bless you and may god keep you i'm gone